Acts chapter 9, verse number 3 uh, through verse number 5. And then we'll kind of dissect the passage here in a little later. Uh, but let's read verse number 3. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Mm. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? We'll yeah. stop there. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time that we can open your word and study it. And Lord, and I pray you help us as Brother Tom was praying that we would pay attention, Lord. And uh, even if we forget the points, if we forget the title, if we forget the passage, uh, Lord, help us to take one truth. Uh, whatever it is that you speak to us about today, oh Lord, and help us to apply it to our lives. Yeah. That will do us so much better, Lord, than us memorizing points or memorizing titles uh, a week later, knowing from the top of our head uh, the message in and out. Help us to be doer of the word yeah. and not a hearer only, deceiving our own selves. Bless me, help me, fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sin. Use me to be a blessing to these guys. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have a seat, guys. Thank you for standing. Our text here uh, revolves around the life of a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. Most of us know him by the, by the name of the Apostle Paul. Right. After being saved, Paul became a powerful weapon in God's hand. Amen. God used the Apostle Paul to start churches in the known world at that time. The Apostle Paul traveled thousands of miles preaching the gospel to people that had never heard about Jesus. Right. He endured also much suffering for the cause of Christ. Yeah. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 22 through 28 talks about all the different things that he went through. It says, five times received I 40 stripes save one. In other mm -hmm. words, 39. <laughs> yeah. I like how the, the word of God does that. It's like. It could have just said 39, you know, but it's okay. It says, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and day have I been in the deep. And I mean, it goes on and on and on talking about all the rough stuff that happened to the Apostle Paul. Right. Little side note, guys, because someone slams the door on, on you when you're passing out tracks, uh -huh. that mm -hmm. doesn't compare to what the Apostle Paul went through. Yeah. Just because yeah. somebody grabs your track and balls it up and throws it in front of you and say, get out of here, or cusses you out, that doesn't compare to what the Apostle Paul went through. Yeah. This guy really suffered. Yeah. And listen, the Apostle Paul was used greatly by the Lord. He wrote uh, at least 13 New Testament books, right. and we can say 14 if he wrote the, the book of Hebrews, mm -hmm. which we don't know. Some people believe that, that he did, he did. some he did. don't, uh, <laughs> but I'll just go ahead and, and since it doesn't say, you know, I'll just go ahead and say that it's not clear, even though we're leaning more towards this side, right? <laughs> but anyways, even though the Apostle Paul was greatly used by the Lord, he wasn't always a Christian. Right, right. Before he met the Lord, Paul was known as Saul of Tarsus, the man that persecuted the church. Saul of Tarsus was a zealous Jew. Mm -hmm. Saul of Tarsus hated the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He hated the gospel. He hated the doctrine of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He hated the local church. He hated God's people, and he was a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. Saul of Tarsus was a lost man who was going to hell because he did not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, right. I wonder, think about this. I wonder how many people in the early church believed that Saul of Tarsus would never get saved. Yeah, yeah. How many would have thought, Saul of Tarsus, that's an impossible case. Right, yeah. He will never get saved. I wonder how many of them actually prayed for Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. How many of them perhaps considered witnessing to Saul of Tarsus? I wonder how many of them believe or regard as Saul as an impossible case. This man will never get saved. Yeah. Imagine that, I imagine that most of them that saw, uh, Saul or, or Paul as we know it now, 
uh, when they saw him, they stayed away from him. Yeah. They hid yeah. from him. They were afraid of him. He's not a man that we need to pray for. He's not a man that we need to be around. He's not a man that we need to love. We need to hate this man. But praise the Lord that Jesus doesn't think that way. Right. Praise the Lord that even though he was an impossible case in the eyes of believers that were saved and transformed right. by Jesus Christ, in the eyes of God, Saul was not an impossible case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. Yeah. That gives me hope because there's a lot of people in my family who are not saved. Yeah. There's a lot of people in my, my wife's family who are not saved, who are, in fact... They are atheists, mm -hmm. devout atheists. And many people will say, that's an impossible case. Mm, yeah. That guy will never get saved. Mm -hmm. And you can probably think about young people that come to church and say, wow, that guy would never turn out for the Lord. Mm. It's impossible for him to turn for to live for God. That's an impossible case. Mm. Look at how he's ruined his life. Look at the decisions he's made. Look at the places he's gone. Look at his track record. Look at his testimony. Destroy impossible case. But it's not impossible for God. Amen. Amen. Right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Saul's story here teaches us something very important. It teaches us that there is hope yes. for Amen. everyone. There's hope for you. And there's hope for everyone. I want to. I want you to notice with me three things here about Saul's life. Mm -hmm. Number one, notice with me the problem in Saul's life. Mm -hmm. You're taking notes. Number one, the problem in Saul's life. Let's look at verse number one. It says, "And Saul, yeah, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him." letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way any I'm sorry any of this way whether they were man or woman he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem mm -hmm. and he and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined there shined round about him a light from heaven notice with me letter A he trusted his works to save him yeah yeah that was his problem. He trusted his works to save him. Saul was a very religious man. Right. In Acts chapter 26 and in Philippians chapter 3, it gives us a detail of just the pedigree. Uh -huh. The type of man the apostle Paul was. He grew up the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Right. He, was, he had the greatest teachers. He was, the Bible says, including Philippians chapter 3, that he was blameless. Mm. So if you found the Apostle Paul, there was nothing that you could have said against him that was wrong. Mm -hmm. If you actually spoke wrong about the Apostle Paul, other people would probably stone you to death. Mm -hmm. How dare you talk about the Apostle Paul that way? That guy is blameless. That guy has no issues. That guy is perfect before God. The best of the best. Mm -hmm. But he was trusting his works right, yeah. to take him to heaven. Saul loved the law. He studied the law. He obeyed the law. He lived by the law. Everything was about the law. If you examine Saul's life for the purpose of finding something to blame him for his relationship with God, as far as the law, you're not going to find anything. Yeah. Saul's problem was that he was trusting his righteousness to save his soul. Yeah. Saul thought that keeping the, the law was going to gain God's favor. And many people around the world, that's the problem that they have. They're trusting that if they do good works, that they'll gain God's favor. Yep. But the reality yep. is that the Bible tells us not by works of righteousness, which we have done, yes, but by His mercies yeah, yeah. that were saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hold your yeah. finger there in Acts. Go to Romans, the very next book, very quickly, just like sword drills. Romans chapter 3. So I want to take advantage of the time that we have. Look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. Very clear, guys. Uh -huh. And I know you guys know this. This is just a reminder. It says, therefore, remember, Romans chapter 3 is talking about how we're sinners. Right. All of us. Whether we're heathens, chapter 1. Whether we're Jews or religious, you can say chapter 2. Right. Chapter 3, all of us are sinners. Right. And look what it says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Justified in his sight. Right. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Yes, right. In other words, hey, this is the Apostle Paul writing, by the way, right. after he got saved. Right. But listen, there's nothing you can do to gain heaven. Right. There's nothing no one can do to gain 
uh, favor with God, it has to be through Jesus Christ. Amen, right? The first problem that the Apostle Paul had was that he was trusting his work. Uh-huh. Uh, the second thing is that he was a sinner before God. Right, right. He was a sinner before God. Before God, Saul was guilty of violating the sixth commandment, which says, "Thou shalt not kill." Mm-hmm. And in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, it says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul wasn't doing that. He was angry. He was mad against his believers. And he wanted to do everything he could to get them in jail, to persecute them, to kill them. He had a strong passion to do evil against God's people. And in doing that, he was violating God's law. Mm. And didn't even realize it. Didn't realize that he was guilty before God. He didn't realize that he was a sinner that deserved to go to hell. Saul's right. problem is a problem shared by everyone around our world. Whether we realize it or not, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. Right. He was also a man full of resentment. A pastor once said, religion without redemption always produces resentment. He heard the truth. He re- he heard the gospel, but he rejected it. Mm-hmm. He heard the word of God, and yet he hated the name of Jesus Christ. Saul hated Jesus. He hated the gospel because he went against his belief of keeping the law. And that's why, listen guys, that's why the Bible teaches us clearly that salvation, listen to this, salvation is, and I, I like how Brother Tom does it all the time when he's presented the gospel. How do I... Call upon the name of the Lord. What does that mean? That means putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that means repenting of our sins. Both of them happen at the same time. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're saying there's nothing that I can do to go to heaven. And when you repent of your sins, you're saying, I'm changing my mind. I used to think that going to heaven was by going to church. I used to think that going to heaven was by getting baptized. Uh I thought it was a God who balanced out my works and I would go to heaven. You change your mind about that. You change your mind about your lifestyle. And you say, God, I'm going to stop going in that direction because your word says not to. I'm going to do 180 degrees. I'm going to turn and I'm going to now follow you. That's what repentance is. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ, trusting only in Jesus and his word and repentance all happen at the same time. And there's a lot of people that will preach, oh, you just need to have faith. Oh, you just need to have faith. Just believe in God. Well, the devil and his demons, they believe in God. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to hell forever. Yeah, yeah. So watch out. Faith and trust in Christ and repentance. He was a man full of resentment. Mm-hmm. And his hating of Christ and the gospel, uh, he went on great lengths to destroy Jesus' name and his work. Notice all the things that he, he did. And we'll try to uh, fly through this. Look at chapter 7 and verse 58. Chapter 7 and verse number 58. It says there in verse number 58, talking about uh, Stephen's death, it says, And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was what? Saul. Saul was there. Mm-hmm. He grabbed all those garments of all those people that grabbed stones and stoned Stephen to oh. death. Look at chapter 8, verse number 1. The Bible says there, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Uh Talking about Stephen, the word consenting means that he was pleased. He was excited that he loved the fact that Stephen was stoned to death. This is this man. He was so mad at God. He was so mad about the gospel that he was excited about the death of this innocent man. Look at chapter 8, verse number 3. As for Saul, he made havoc. That word havoc there means to ruin, to destroy, to devastate. He says that he, in verse 3, made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling man and woman, committed them to prison. Uh Just pulling out woman, pulling out children, pulling out men. I'm telling you, this guy was a devout Jew Doing everything he can to destroy Christianity. Right, right. Look at chapter 9, verse number 1. <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, mm. went on to the high priest and he basically asked for permission that he would be able to 
get more Christians in jail. Wow. This guy was hungry to just do evil against Christians. You know what I call this man Saul? I call him a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. I call him a, 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 ter- a Pharisee that's a terrorist. An impossible case, guys, but not impossible to God. Amen. He had a problem. His problem was that he was trusting his works. The problem was that he was, wasn't realizing that he was a sinner before God. The problem, guys, is that he was fighting God, fighting the gospel. Right. And we see it in all these works that he does. Saw murder believers. Saw ordained wars from Jewish authorities, which we just read about. Saul did everything he could to oppose the name of Christ. And I have so many passages, but I don't have the time to see him. Saul testified against believers to facilitate their murders. Saul forced believers to blaspheme the Lord who saved them. His own testimony after he gets saved. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. I always like for people to see the verses. And see it. Hey, this is what the Bible says. Right. Not what Brother Jeffrey says. Right. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse 12. We'll come back to Acts. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Verse number 12. Here is his own testimony. Look at what he called himself. Who he was. 1 mm. uh, Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. It says... Uh, chapter 1, uh, let's see here, uh, verse number 12, it says, And I thank God, Jesus uh, Christ, our Lord, who have enabled me, for that, thou, that, that he counted me faithful, putting me uh, into the ministry. Look what it says. Who was before a what? This is talking about himself. Yeah. Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, Injurious or injurious, I guess, but I obtained mercy yeah. because I did not ignorant, uh, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Right. Wow, he called himself a blasphemer, yeah. slandering God's name, right. a persecutor, going after his church, injurious, who was who one who speaks and acts harshly against others. Mm-hmm. And an unbeliever, someone who realized that he was not putting his faith in the right place. Saul of Tarsus uh, had faith, but he had faith in his own goodness. He had faith in his own righteousness. He had faith in the law. He had faith in his ability to keep it. Because of all of this, Saul of Tarsus was a man who was feared by the early church. Number one, we see uh, Saul's problem. Number two... Even though we see his problem, we see, number two, the power of God in his life. Acts chapter number nine, guys. Let's go back there. The power of God in Saul's life. Saul of Tarsus was in a place where people, the people of God could not reach him. He was deaf to their pleas. He was deaf to the gospel. He was blind to the truth. But God intervened in, in Paul's or Saul's life and changed him forever. Right. What everybody thought, he'll never get saved. Jesus said, you know what? I'll show you what my power can do. Right. I'll show you what my gospel can do. Right. And that's why the apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that the gospel, guys, that the gospel is powerful. Yes, it's dynamite. It's flowing. It creates change in the life of, pers- and of a person. Yes, that's why a drunk can become a preacher. Yes. That's why a drug addict can become yes. a missionary. That's why a, a liar can stand up and preach the word of God. Yes, right. Because of the gospel. Because right. it's powerful. Yes. It reaches everybody. Mm-hmm. And the apostle Paul himself is an evidence. The power of God. Notice with me how God confronted the, the apostle Paul. About his salvation. Verse number 4. There in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9 and verse 4 says. And he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying unto him. Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? The Lord confronted him. Right where he was. He was heading. To Damascus. To arrest believers. There on his way. God confronted the sin of Saul. Saul. Saul, what are you doing? Uh-huh. Do you remember when someone preached the gospel to you? Mm-hmm. And they told you you're a sinner? Yep. And that your sins are going to send you to hell? 
That was the Lord confronting you there. Right, right. Hey, that sin of lying that you did. Uh-huh. That sin yeah. of looking on a woman unto lust. Uh-huh. That sin of stealing. That sin of disobedience. Right. God was confronting your sin right. to help you to realize that without God, you are dirty. Right. That without God, your even your righteousness is filthy rags. Right. And so the Lord confronted him there and said, Paul, Saul, what are you doing? Uh-huh. Why are you persecuting me? Wow. I know you're persecuting my people. I know you're persecuting the church. But really, in the reality, you're coming after me. Mm-hmm. You have an issue with me. Wow. You've yeah. been rejecting me. Notice how he confronted him. The light came on in Saul's life. And God confronted his sin. Yeah. Not only that, but notice how God convicted him. Mm-hmm. Verse 5. It says, and he said... Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And notice what it says. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Mm -hmm. The word prick there was a long, extremely sharp object that farmers use to guide their ox as they're plowing the field. Many of the times, these animals, these beasts, Sometimes we want to do their own thing. Right. You know, they'll try to, instead of going in a straight line, how the farmer wanted to do it, they'll start deviating. Uh-huh. And so here comes the farmer with this long prick. It was a sharp object. And we just prick them to try to get them to go back to the yeah. spot where yeah. they're supposed right. to go to. Yes, and you know what, what the animals would do? Dumb animals. <laughs> instead of doing what they were supposed to do, they'll kick. They'll yeah. kick back. Uh-huh. And you know what happened? What happens when they kick, that sharp object just kept on going through yeah. their their muscle. They were feeling a lot more pain. Right, yeah. it, they suffered a whole lot so more. Yeah, it right, makes yeah. it a whole lot harder. I, I, and this is what God is saying. Hey, basically, Apostle Paul, you've been an animal that's been okay, ignoring the word of God. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. an animal that I've been trying to tell you. I am the way and the truth and the life. I know that you think the law, the law, the law, but it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. And he kept on kicking and wow. he kept on persecuting. The side effects of his rejection was going after God's people. Wow. And he kept on kicking. Mm. And the Lord kept on pricking. Yep. And the Lord kept on pricking. Yes. And the Lord kept on trying to get his attention. And listen, uh, God convicted him. God tried to get him to come back. And here in this place, he finally got a hold of him. Mm-hmm. Finally mm-hmm. got him to realize, Good stuff. stop rejecting me. Amen. It's not worth it. Yeah. And listen, I know this is salvation here, but even as believers, even as Christians, listen, you start rejecting God. You start rejecting his word. Mm-hmm. The Lord is going to use that prick. He's going to try to get your attention to get back on track. Then you keep on kicking. You keep on rejecting the Lord. Guess what? It's just going to hurt more. Right, right. The Lord's going to bring stuff along the ways to get your attention. He might just mess up your, your you know, your brand new car. You might just lose your job. You might just lose your health. But he's going to keep on pricking yeah, until yeah, you come yeah. back. And do what you're supposed to do. Right, the farmer is not going to use that prick if the ox is going in the right direction. Yes, he, how he convicted him. Number three, or, or the next part, under this point, how he, how God converted him. Amen. How God converted him. And the way that God converted the Apostle Paul is the same way each and every one of us got saved. Mm-hmm. Look at verse number five. After God confronts him with his sin, and after the Lord, come on in, brother. Good to see you. Oh, he's he's brought some uh, Caribbean weather with us. <laughs> Amen. And this morning I woke up a little hotter, you know, as I step out of the house. But uh, look at verse number five. After the Lord convicts it, convicts him and confronts his sin, notice how the Apostle Paul got saved. Notice this. Don't miss it. Look at it. It says in verse 5. And he said, Who art thou? What's the next word? Lord. Lord. Mm -hmm. Before that, he never called Jesus Christ Lord. But here he's realized, this is the Lord. He is the I Am. And he says, uh, I am, and Jesus responded to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, and it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And in verse 6 again, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me 
to do. So how did he get saved? He realized that Jesus Christ was his Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 talks about that. That if thou shalt confess with thou mouth the Lord Jesus. Uh You must confess that Jesus is Lord in order to get saved. And that's what the Apostle Paul did here. We got to move on. Number one, guys, the problem of Saul or Saul's problem. Number two, the power of God in his life. Praise the Lord that there are no impossible cases in God's family. There are no impossible cases as far as a lost person. Because listen, if there's a person that most people thought would never get saved, was the apostle Paul. That's right, right? But praise the Lord that God can reach down and save them and rescue them and transform them and give them a purpose. Number three, and we'll finish with this. I love this. The proof yeah. of Saul's conversion. Amen. The proof. Wow. Man, I, I love this part. This is my favorite part. Look at verse 6 through 9. Let's read that. It says, And he trembling and started and said, Lord, Lord. Uh, he only said it once. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Mm-hmm. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told to thee uh, what thou must do. And the man which journeyed with them stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Here's the proof that somebody got saved right here, the Apostle Paul. And it's the same proof, the same evidence that we will see in someone who accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Number one is proven by their works. Amen. Proven by their works. Look what it says again in verse uh, verse number six. Here's the first response that the Apostle Paul tells the Lord Jesus. He says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Yeah. Willingness to serve God. A willingness to do what God says. That's what the Apostle Paul had. And not just that, but a willingness to obey his word. The Lord told him clearly, arise, go into the city, and just wait there, I'll tell you what to do. He stayed there for three days. Mm -hmm. He waited and waited and waited and waited on the Lord. What was he doing? He was obeying the word of God. Mm -hmm. Someone who gets saved is someone who says, you know what? I love the word of God. I must read it. I must study it. I must apply it. This is God's manual for my life. Uh The Bible tells us clearly in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, it's going to be evident. There's going to be proof. Your works will be evident. Also, it was proven, his salvation was proven by his words. Mm -hmm. Look with me in verse number 20. We're almost done. Verse number 20. The Bible says there, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Wow. Man, we have a terrorist. This is what I call him. A Pharisee terrorist going after Christians putting them in jail, killing them. I mean, destroying, separating families. Get saved. Now has a desire to serve God. And God, straightway, the Bible says right away, he didn't want to wait to go to Bible college. He didn't want to wait several years for some kind of, you know, discipleship, even though he was trained for some time. But he just wanted to preach Jesus Christ. And that's one evidence of a person that's gotten saved. They just realize, wow, I have this great news to share with other people. Someone took the time to share the gospel with me, this precious good news. I must tell others. That's what it's all about, guys. You have been given good news. Mm -hmm. It's time for you to give it to someone else. Proven by his works, proven by his words, and proven by his walk. When Saul got saved... He abandoned the sins of self-righteousness. He abandoned and he left behind the hatred that he had towards Christians. He abandoned the desire to kill. And he embraced a new life of love of all men. Think about this. He was a Jew. And yet the Lord called him to be a missionary, a preacher, an apostle to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. 
You know, Jews and Gentiles, they didn't get along too well. And yet the Apostle Paul was willing to give his life, the rest of his life, suffered. And we talked about that during the beginning, all the different things he went through. He did all of that to reach not just Jews, which he started at the beginning, but especially his calling was to the Gentiles. The Lord changed this man. He had hatred in his heart, and now he has love for other people. Not just his own people, the Jews, which Romans chapter chapter uh, number uh, ten talks about, uh, but a love for everybody, right, right, a love right. for people that don't look like like him, uh-huh. a love for people that don't know God, that maybe don't have the same knowledge that he had. Right. Which he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee guys. This guy was a scholar, yep. and yet he was willing to go down to the lowest level so, so that he could reach people for Christ. Yes, sir. Amen. Right. Proven. By his walk. The message is this. There's hope guys. There's hope for your family who is lost. There's hope for your friends. Perhaps that is away from God. There's not an impossible case for God. Nothing is impossible for him. But listen to me. If you're here and you're saved. And you haven't proven. By the things that you do. The things that you say. The way that you live. Watch out, you might want to check your salvation. Yes, sir. Right. Because one of the evidences of someone that is a believer is that they just they, they have a passion for God. Amen. And look, there's times when we, you know, we fall, there's times when we, we don't want to read our Bible. That's just called the flesh. Right. But there's just there's some people that basically say that the power of salvation, the power of God that changes life is not evident. It's not mm. it's not gonna happen. It's mm. not true. No, you're the one that's not true. You're the one that hasn't applied the gospel yeah. Yeah. to your life. That's right. right. An impossible case, but not impossible to God. Amen. Let's pray. Right. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul who was willing to suffer, willing to go everywhere and preach the gospel. Because of him here in America, Lord, and in this side of the world, we have the Bible in our language. We have the word of God. We have the gospel. I pray, God, that you help us Lord, to see people as you will see them. Help us, Lord, not to see the tattoos. Help us not to see the dreadlocks. Help us, Lord, not to see the scars. Help us not to see the skin color or their social status. But, Lord, help us to see them like you saw Saul, someone you could use for your glory and honor. Help us, Lord, to realize that your word can penetrate through any hard heart. You can do a work that we can't. And help us also as soul winners, Lord, to remember that our job is just to be a witness. Our job is to just warn people of hell and give them the good news and allow the Holy Spirit to do that transformational work. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, wonderful example and story of the Apostle Paul. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Please help us, Lord, to remember that there are no impossible cases in your life. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name.